May God take each class and produce in you the revelation of Jesus in a more real way so that you'll go out from these classes and particularly when this year of wonderful study is ended that you'll go out into your ministries to reach your world and heal your world. That's what we're talking about. Now, last week, we began dealing with this subject of the will of God, and today we continue along this line. We're over to page 18 in our textbook, Healing the Sick, a living classic, written in 1949 and 50, now published by Harrison House as a living classic, and when you get through with it, you're going to be a menace to the devil <laughs> and to his kingdom. That's what we want. So today, as a scriptural base, let's read the Lord's Prayer together. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now, talking about the will of God. A very important phrase there in verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Isn't it strange how that we interpret our doctrinal influence into phrases like that? Thy will be done. We cannot today give you a study on the Lord's Prayer. Someday, I'd like to teach a whole year on the Lord's Prayer. Not a time in that prayer are you told to ask for anything. That's the paradox of the tradition that we have made out of prayer, begging and supplicating God for favors that he's already paid the supreme price to give to everybody. So, bottom line, we don't have to go through life begging and crying and moaning and groaning and hoping we can get something from God. All that he has is ours. All things are yours. You are Christ's. Christ is God's. We are on a direct hookup with the best of everything. And if we can bring ourselves to think that way, talk that way, then we will act that way. Thy will be done. There's not a one of those phrases. Thy kingdom come. That doesn't mean, oh, God, send your kingdom. Never. It all is in the same mode as Mary, the virgin, when the angel had spoken and explained how that the Holy Ghost had overshadowed her and a seed was created in her womb. And that holy thing which would be born of her would be the Son of God. Call his name Emmanuel. Call his name Jesus, God with us. She said... Be it unto me according to your word. Be it unto me. These are not supplications. These are confessions. These are the essences of knowledge being affirmed in our confession. Thy kingdom come, boy. Yes. In me, let it be all the time. When I get up of a morning, thy kingdom come. When I get there, it'll be there. Let's go, Lord. 
Thy will be done. Not, oh God, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to. But if you want to do it, how much I want you to. That has nothing to do with it. Thy will be done. If I could paraphrase that in other words, I would put it like this. Let thy word be accomplished. See? That's what it means. Thy will be done. Be it done. I touch the sick, I say, the will of God be done. And they're healed. Never does that mean, maybe you get healed, maybe you won't, but let God's will be done. Anybody knows what the will of God is in matters where he has revealed his will redemptively. Now, some folks get hung up. I don't know whether God wants you to go to Arkansas or Timbuktu. So I can't find Arkansas or Timbuktu in the Bible. So I can't show you that in the Bible. And you might pray, Lord, show me. You want me to go to Arkansas or Timbuktu? Some way you'll get an inclination, a dream, an idea. Someone will say something to you. If you're consecrated to God, God wants you to know whether to go to Arkansas or Timbuktu. Now, that's if you're going on business. If you're going as a representative of Jesus to win souls, it don't matter. Take your choice and go. Who cares whether you go to Arkansas or Timbuktu? God don't. If the souls and both of them take your pick, figure the one that you can win the most souls and go get them, baby. You don't have to make a big deal and pray and wait. Some people agonize and spend half their life won't know whether God wants them to go to Arkansas or Timbuktu. And then they decide it's Timbuktu. And those kind of people spend the rest of their life thinking it was supposed to have been Arkansas. Never fails. You don't have to do that. Thy will be done means I read it. Wow, let it be today. Lord, we're going out to do business. I'm walking in your will everything we do together based on your word. Let your will be done. Just every time we touch it, let it be done. Let it be done. Let it be done. We touch this and let them be healed. Touch that one in trouble. Let them be lifted. Touch that one. Been fussing and fighting. Let their home be cured. Let thy will be done. All day, let thy will be done. Oh boy, Lord, I'm walking in your will. How wonderful to be a channel for your will to be done. We already know what your will is. Let your will flow through me. That's what it means. You know, that would be worth your year. It'd be worth it if just that got straightened out. You are the will of God in action. You are the living manifestation of the walking, talking, loving, helping will of God. Jesus came, and he showed us his will. I came, and I keep showing his will. It's the same. You ever hear anybody quote and get real holy about it? Last week, we ended up on that scripture, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, Hebrews 10, 7, referring to Jesus. Did you ever read that yourself? Oh, boy, I read that sometimes when I'm praying or when I get ready to preach, and it turns me on. So I tell the people, I say, from the Bible. I find a place where it was written and I open it up and I say, I announce to you, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That's what I'm here for. No wonder preachers go out and get discouraged and quit and backside and turn off and all this silly stuff. They've never discovered who they are. I have preachers ask me all the time, preachers that have known me for years, how is it, T.L.? You're not a kid anymore. And you sound just like you did when you was a kid, when you were just starting. You always have the same enthusiasm. How can I dry up when I know I am God in person? And God's compassion and care and love is just as vivid today as it ever was. Am I supposed to look with glory and awe upon the person of Jesus Christ as he walked in human flesh and say, oh, that's it, that's it, that. Now I'm supposed to look at me and say, that's it, that's it, that's it. 
because I got my ideas from him. He said, follow me. I did. He said, I'll make you. He did. He came into me and made me what he is. Now, everywhere I go, all I have to do is say, let thy will be done, Lord. And things start popping. <laughs> Sick people get cured. Blind people get their eyes open. Lepers get cleansed. Sinners repent. Unbelievers become believers. Believers get to be better believers. Cities are changed. Politicians are lifted. Graduates from higher learning schools get the principles of God at work in a human being and go out and succeed. There are beggars. Came to our meeting as beggars that today own their businesses because God came their way in the form of a man that they called T.L. Osborne. Jesus is still doing his will. He's doing it through us. Do you understand that? Thy will be done. Now, I want to share a little bit of the gospel according to T.L. and Daisy before we continue with our lesson. I'm seeding these. I feel this is an uplift to you, and it will help seed you for greatness. Don't ever decide to be ordinary. Nobody hooked up with God should be ordinary. We're surrounded with ordinary people, but we are extraordinary. That's what I think. It's worked over three decades. Probably nobody in the world, no couple ever in the history of the world, have taken Jesus face to face to as many millions of neglected, unreached people as T.L. and Daisy Osborne. We're not ordinary. I didn't say we're better than anybody else, but we're not ordinary. We've taken this Bible literally and believe what it says, and Christ is in us, and that's our hope of glory. Hallelujah. And that's your hope of glory. Let's go down here to a city called Camagüey. The service was attended by great throngs of people. After the message, over 1,500 accepted Christ. Then the mass prayer was offered for the healing of the sick, and God surely answered from heaven. One man who was blind from birth was led to the meeting. As he listened to the message, he fell to the ground. Having seen the Lord Jesus in a vision, he lay there for some time. Those around him thought he had died. Suddenly, he seemed to regain consciousness, stood to his feet with an expression of awe and joy on his face, declaring, I have seen the Lord, and now I can see. I was blind, but now I can see. I didn't do that. They departed and preached everywhere. Mark 16, 20, the Lord working with them, confirming his word with signs following. When you depart and go everywhere preaching, the same Lord will be with you. Don't straitjacket him with a bunch of theological ideas that keep him pinned down and tie him up to 16th century English and make him sound like an old-fashioned has-been. Turn him loose. Walk with him and let him do his thing through you. And he will take care of the doing. His sight was restored. He could see fine print. The multitude was hysterical with joy when they heard this report. Six deaf mutes were healed during this service, one of which was 55 years of age that had been born in this condition. One young man who was going to commit suicide was gloriously converted. Several hernias, growths, and various classes of sicknesses and paralysis were instantly healed. To God be the glory. Now, I want to take you over to Ponce, we went back to that city, this is one of the few times we've ever done this, one year later. 
I started to preach early today, but after greeting the audience, I was told that Juan Santos was present. Juan Santos had been healed the year before. He had been healed here in our last crusade, the night I preached on the healing of the cripple from Mark chapter 2, you know, that was carried on the bed and raised up. We asked him to give his testimony of his miraculous healing since it had been a year there in the city. He had been 16 years dragging in the dirt sea, and we thought it'd be nice to open the meeting the second year and let them see that these things last. Oh, I forgot to tell you the reason I was going to give this with you. We received three or four real strong threatening letters from that area, from important people who said they had organized and they had a group and they would assassinate us if we came back to that city. That we were never to set foot there again. They were ready. They had their agents. They knew who we were. They knew where we were. And when they wrote us, they told us where we had been. They knew all about us. They were keeping tabs. They said the snare was being laid and they would persecute us. They would run ads in papers and they would go on the radio and they were going to kill us if we came. They planned, above all, to expose our deception. They had proof. They were announcing this everywhere. They had proof that two of the greatest miracles from last year were farces. <laughs> and they were going to do something about this. I thought that was so funny when they went at it like that. They're so dumb, you know. <laughs> Don't you feel sorry for the devil? <laughs> you know, Satan just has two strategies. Keep you from performing a miracle, or if you do, deny it. <laughs> And the communists are just exactly like that. I knew it was all bluff. So we called down there. We had Pastor Carlos Vasquez, who was a wonderful man of God, and the United Evangelical Church overseer, Pastor E. Echevarita of Juan Adias Township. And we had them go have conversations with these two people that these nuts had picked out that they were going to expose. One of them was Juan Santos. The other one was the woman that I read about last week, I believe, that the sides of her legs were like leather. They were all worked up about those two. Well, of course, they found both of them so beautiful, and Juan Santos never did quit. He just continually goes in high school auditoriums and churches. He spends his life telling people, showing people what he did, and he's become quite a preacher, telling it. I'd help anybody preach, wouldn't it? <laughs> but the year before, a remarkable thing also had happened. A blind woman had come through the crowd and had touched my trouser legs and got healed. Now, here, listen to this. So we started to preach early, but after greeting the audience, I was told that Juan Santos was present. He had been healed in our last crusade when I preached on the healing of Mark II. So we asked him to give his testimony of his miraculous healing. He testified for about 30 minutes. He's a regular preacher. I mean, he liked it. <laughs> there are few cases in the Bible as dramatic and marvelous as this case. He had been shot through the spine, destroying his spinal cord and the nerves below the waist. It left him totally paralyzed in both legs. For 15 years, he was crippled. Both legs were drawn, double. They were dead, withered. They were just skin and bones and were completely stiff, drawn in a double position. One arm hung paralyzed at his side and the other shook constantly so that he could hardly feed himself. His head also shook because he had attempted suicide by hitting himself with a club. The blow only caused the palsy. He could hardly talk because his tongue and his throat were partially paralyzed. He dragged himself on the ground with his hands, this one hand kind of wobbling, but the other hand was still good. And his drawn, withered legs resting in the dirt between each swing of his arms. He was losing his mind. He was instantly healed and is now as perfect as any man could be. His testimony is known by thousands throughout this area. As an undeniable miracle of God's power, he's become a radiant Christian witness. When Mr. Santos finished his heart-moving testimony, which was more convincing than a thousand sermons, an old lady had mounted the platform, anxious to tell what God did for her in our last crusade. Now, we don't often get this pleasure. And so I wrote it down. You know, if we'd go back, Daisy and I thought, maybe we ought to do like Paul. Maybe we ought to go back to every city where we've had a crusade now and have a seminar and have a short crusade. And don't we deserve the joy of getting to know about these people that have lived their lives out in happiness and joy and health and peace. Maybe they were lepers and today they're businessmen. We've never indulged ourselves in that joy because we want to keep reaching the unreached. There's so many more that have never seen anything. You pray that God will let us do that. I wouldn't go unless whether that would be more 
profitable for his kingdom than to keep going to new places. If we can get enough new people like you to go to these new places, then maybe Daisy and I can go to some of these other places and get to hear some more things like this. In a sense, we deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, I'll take that back. We're just people. You don't ever deserve anything. It's all by grace, and if I live to be 140, and that's what I'm planning to do, I want to just keep getting some more people saved. So we invited her to test drive. She wanted to tell it. So we said, okay. So now here's the story she told. Friends told me about a man who was performing miracles. I tried to get someone to take me to the meeting, but no one would guide me. I decided to go myself. I finally found my way there. They told me the service was to begin at 5 p.m., so I went at 12 noon. I listened, but was not healed that day. Then I tried to get home in the dark. I got lost. Did it ever say she was blind? Seemed like I never did even say that. I knew it. Yeah, up there before, she had been healed of total blindness. Okay, I'd skip that line. Then I tried to get home in the dark, an old lady. I got lost. I always carry a box of matches in my pocket, so I took it out and I struck one and I cried out, I'm blind, I'm blind. A man heard me and came to help me, but I was afraid of the man. I was afraid he was leading me astray in the night. So I told him to leave me and that I would stay there by the road and sleep that night. He left me and I was alone again. I finally found my way home at four o'clock in the morning. The next day, I went again and got near the platform and purposed that if I could just touch the evangelist's trouser legs, I'd be healed. I listened closely to his message, and when the prayer was offered, I believed. The people all around me were standing tightly together. They just packed right up against the platform. They were packed tightly together. I finally managed to get some space to move a bit, and I reached out my hands around the edge of the platform trying to touch the man of God. I remember her, just that arm just reaching out. I didn't know she's blind enough. You know, people all around, a lot of times they'll reach for you and all that, wanting to tell you something, so you have to keep preaching, pay that no attention. After a long time, I was begging God to help me touch his servant. Now, you know, poor little woman, she had that in her mind. You can't blame her for it. She didn't need to do that. She didn't need to do that. And I'm sure if she hadn't have done that and had not been able to get to the platform, she'd have got enough of the word in a little while and caught on. She wouldn't have needed that and she'd have got healed anyway. But the woman in the Bible touched the border of Jesus' garment. Brother Hayes lays hands on the sick and prays for them. Anything we do to contact sick people, send calls to them, anoint them with oil, all that, we'll get into all that a little bit later in, in our textbook. All of that is good. I always say the best is when you know the truth Hear the gospel, believe it, and you contact God direct through Jesus, your high priest, and get what you want. Then you always have him with you. That's the best. You understand? So here's what she tells. After a long time, I was begging God to help me touch his servant, and finally I heard him moving near my side of the platform. I reached for him and found his legs and grabbed his trousers. Then my eyes came open. And I could see everything clearly. I shouted, hallelujah, hallelujah, I can see, I can see. And I'll never forget those screams she let out. And she held while she was reaching for me. When she grabbed him first, there was a little interim that I didn't cover because I was tired writing. The preachers went over and hit her and made her stop that. And I turned to the preachers in love. I said, oh, let her alone. I said, if that makes her happy, let her hang on. It don't bother me. And I just went on preaching. They sat down and left her alone. And pretty soon she began screaming. I see. I can see. It was a very great miracle. I can see you people tonight, she was saying. And then she was explaining. I'm writing for her. I go about telling of God's miracle of my poor blind eyes. I'm so happy and thankful to God. Now, it was not those trouser legs that healed that woman's eyes. No more than it was the garment of Jesus that healed the woman in the Bible. It was the woman's faith. This is on page 343. All those diary notes are back here in the back end of this book. I'm just pulling one of them up now and then and reading it to you to share with you. It was the woman's faith. By touching the garment, she set a time in which she would herself believe and have faith for God to do the miracle. And as soon as we believe, God does the work. After these two testimonies, I exhorted the audience about 10 minutes, as I didn't need to preach <laughs> these two testimonies. 
were sermon enough. Then we led the audience in a prayer. Hundreds accepted Christ as their Savior. Then the people began receiving healing. Totally blind man came to the platform, so happy he could see. As he said, very clear, very clear. A paralyzed man was restored and stomped his feet for joy. Many others were set free. The crowd rejoiced as miracle after miracle was reported for almost two hours. Now, everything Jesus did, I'm on page 18 of our textbook now, everything he did, Everything for needy humanity during his earthly ministry was a direct revelation of the perfect will of God in the human race. F.F. F. Bosworth in his book Christ the Healer says this. This very good quote. Perhaps no one could be more conservative than the scholars of the Episcopalian Church. And yet, the commission appointed to study the subject of spiritual healing for the body after three years of study and research in both the Bible and in history, they report back to the church this, quote, the healing of Jesus was done as a revelation of God's will for humanity, continuing to quote the Episcopalians. Because we discovered that his will is fully revealed in the scriptures, we further report that no longer can the church pray for the sick with the faith-destroying phrase, if it be thy will. The Episcopalians figure that out. Mr. Bosworth continues, the message everywhere taught in the Bible, in the Gospels, is one of complete healing for spirit and body for all who will come to him. Many today say, I believe in healing, but I don't believe it's for everyone. If it's not for everyone, then how could we ever pray the prayer of faith for anyone? Among all those who sought healing from Christ during his earthly ministry, there is only one who prayed for healing with the words, if it be thy will. That was the poor outcast leper that we read about who did not know what Christ's will was. He couldn't even go to the synagogue, to the temple. No teacher would teach a leper. He had no way of knowing what God's will was. The first thing Christ did to that fellow was to correct this uncertainty by assuring him, I will. Would you say that in the classroom out loud? I will. Jesus says, I will. It is no longer, if it be thy will. Students, cancel that forever when you're praying for anything that Jesus died to provide. Now, we'll get over here. Chapter 39, page 293 of our textbook. We'll deal with the seven redemptive names and, oh, boy, is that good. You never pray, if it be thy will, when you're praying and asking God for something that Jesus died to provide. When you're asking for a redemptive blessing. In all of those occasions, it's thy will be done, let her fly. Hallelujah. <laughs> thy will be done, let it be. Not you can do it if you want to. If you don't want to do it, it's okay. I'll stay sick if you want to teach me something. If you beat me over the head, oh God, I'll keep being beat over the head. You'll bruise me and bloody my nose and booger me up something terrible, but I'll love you anyway. Oh boy, I'm glad I'm not pagan. The pagans say that. Can I repeat? You never pray if it be thy will when you're praying for any blessing that Jesus died to provide or that's revealed by one of God's seven redemptive names. I don't know whether you ever thought about it or not, but the reason God revealed himself by seven redemptive names is because seven is a perfect number. It's total, complete, perfect. You've only got seven needs. There is nobody here or nobody to whom you will ever preach that will have but seven needs. 
My God shall supply all your needs. My God is a perfect physician. All seven needs require a form of healing. This course is on the ministry of healing the sick. Everybody that is in need is lacking any one of the seven provisions that Jesus died to provide, which are revealed by God's seven redemptive names, anyone in need of any of those is to that extent sick because they're below the level of the whole person that God created in Adam and Eve, the devil messed up, and God recreated in Jesus and provided for you and me to have. And I've got it. I'm full, complete. Because of the influence of negative theology, there are always those, when I talk like that, that are reactionary to it and say, why don't he stop strutting? Why does he stop standing so straight? Why does he blow all the time? But to people who understand redemption, they say, wow, me too. I just hope that's the crowd I'm talking to. I don't do it to brag, but how in the world can I not stand straight and run fast and yell loud and smile big when I know so much that's so good in that book and the testator died? Everything he left is in force. He's come back from the dead and he's at the right hand of God, my lawyer, to see that I can have everything he died to give me. And what he died to give me is very simple. You boil it down to the bottom line. He died so I could be like him. When he died, he got rid of the only problem him and God ever had. <laughs> you want to know what it is? He got himself out of just one body and got himself into you and you and you and me and people all over the world millions and millions of wonderful people who are Jesus people turned loose on this earth and the devil is in trouble and we are in charge because of the will of God that we're talking about wow I hope that comes through to you only one ever prayed for healing and said if it be thy will the first thing Christ did was correct the uncertainty by assuring him, I will. So it is no longer, if it be thy will, it is God's will to do what he promised. Let that I will settle it forever with you. God will heal the sick. If he wills to heal one, he wills to heal all. He'll even heal sinners, unbelievers. When he heals them, he forgives their sin too. Isn't that terrific? How we stand around and poke our fingers at him, God's trying to run around and heal them and help them. How we stand around and cuss them out and say, you ought to go to hell, you deserve it, and when you do, you get what you deserve, and act like we're almost tickled when they burn, the hotter they burn, the better we're going to like it, because they deserve it. Don't ever be a preacher like that. Don't ever be a preacher like that. Love people. God loves people. All the time we're raging, God's loving. Your raging can't ever drive people to do anything. Driving, condemning, finger pointing, must, saying you must, must, all that stuff. That never motivates people. We have to motivate people. God don't butt into people's will. He don't butt in against their desire. If they don't want it, God won't butt in. So you can't drive them to it. You've got to lead them to it. The minute you get them in the corner and start shooting scriptures at them and sending them to hell, they're just going to roll the blind down. You're going to empty your shooter and they're going to go to hell. You preached a good sermon and said a lot of truth, but you didn't save a soul. See? You say, well, I know somebody who preached preach like that. Well, wonderful. That's an exception. But Jesus never talked that way. And I'm imitating Jesus. He reasoned with people and loved people. Said nice things to people. He never, ever put anybody down, never called anybody a sinner. Never, never, never. 
And did you know what? You've heard me say in this course several times, sinner. And did you know every time I say it, I ouch, but I say it because of church tradition that says sinner. And I go along with them. But did you know I have taken the word out of my books as fast as I edit them? That word is coming out. There's a lot of other ways to deal with them besides calling them that. The minute we call them that, the wall goes up. You say we're supposed to coddle them? I didn't say that. But we got to have some wisdom. And we can reach... Well, that's too deep, too big. I don't want to confuse you. Maybe I'll get back on it and help you a little bit. But the point is, people are hurting. And we have salvation. Let that I will that Jesus said to the leper. Settle it forever with you. God will heal the sick. Boy, I hear that ringing back in my head. Everyone says, Osborne said, don't call anybody a sinner. Can you just leave that limbo a little bit? Let me deal with it another day. I haven't got time in this lesson. Let me help you. I'll get back on it because it's in me deep. It's in me because I'm going through my book getting that word out of there. Picture a non-Christian. That's a nice way to say it. You're saying the same thing. A non-believer. That doesn't offend people. A sinner? You call me a sinner? They get mad. Now, preachers, please. I'm in too deep. See, I'm losing time. I shouldn't do that. Because these lessons are too important. But people go out on a street corner and they preach and they preach and they get people saved and they just finger jab people and send them to hell and jab at them. And I love every one of them. I see them on the street and sometimes I'll cry. Daisy and I'll stand back and cry. Loving them. We're so glad they're out there. I wish they wouldn't do it. I wish they could have it a little nicer. But I'm not going to argue with them. They're out there doing it and I love them for it. And they can tell me about many that have gotten saved when they said, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. God bless them. Let's not fuss about that. I'm just trying to share a little light. But sometimes people are mean. They'll jump on you if you'll say something new. I didn't mean that. I don't want to cross with anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. Do you feel my love coming through to you? You know, as you grow, you share something that's new that contradicts tradition. Then here you are, you're spending 30 minutes cleaning up your tracks so you won't hurt somebody's feeling because you said something that's not supposed to be said. I didn't mean that. I didn't come on here to hurt anybody or change anything for preachers or pastors or evangelists or anything. Let's love people. But I do want to keep saying that God loves people and it's better if we give them that love message. Let that I will settle it forever, forever that God will heal the sick. 2 Peter 3.9 he is not willing that any, say any, any. there in the class, say any. any, not willing that any should perish, but that all, say all, all, should come to repentance. Isn't that beautiful? James 5, 14. Is any sick among you? Say any. Any, any includes you if you're sick. Tell the people that when you go out to minister. When you go to the hospital bed, say, any includes you. I told a woman dying of tuberculosis that one time. She got healed. She never thought about that. That helped her. See, I keep saying to you, if you started this course with me, and you weren't up very much, but your faith is mounting every time. Now, by the time we get through, you're going to be walking tall and feeling high. Hallelujah. When you do... Remember the steps. Note them down particularly as you move through this course. The steps, the points that shook you and brought you around. Make them your main sermons. You can help other people catch on to those points because they're right where you were. They need those same things to help them up. If it impressed you, it'll impress them. That's what we want to do. We want to give them faith. Anybody can run around and pray for sick people. But you won't do much good. You might get a miracle now and then just out of God's mercy. But let's help everybody. When I go, I expect everybody to get healed. You said they all get healed. I didn't say that. I said I expect it. And it's for them all. I expect all. In the same way that I expect all sinners to be saved. I never leave out one. You ever hear preachers preach a sermon and say, Is there one sinner here that would like to come to Christ? And sometimes he'll get one. But he ignored all the rest of them. You never hear T.L. Osborne say that. When I go, I say, let every person in this building that's not right with God get up and come forward right now. And they all do. They just do what I tell them. I never leave out anybody. When I go to pray for the sick, I don't take ten. I say, I want every person in here that's got any pain or sickness anywhere in your body right now, get ready to be healed. Every one of you will either be healed instantly or your sickness will die and you'll begin to recover. Now, that's always conditional upon the person. But conditional upon the person 
puts the monkey back on me, I've got to share truth with the person that'll help them be able to believe. Then we share together, we bring them to Christ, and that makes the ministry of healing the sick. Hallelujah. Any sick, let him call. Prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him or her up. Of all those who were bitten by the fiery serpents, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, it is written that as many as looked to the brazen serpent lived. Even so now, whosoever shall look to Christ as Redeemer is saved and healed. The words whosoever, whosoever will, and so forth, are always used to invite the unconverted to be saved. The words as many, everyone, all, any, and so forth, are words used to invite the sick and the diseased to be healed. Do you believe that? Both invitations are always universal, and the results are always positively promised. Shall be saved. Shall have life. Shall recover. Shall raise him up. Heal them all. As many as touched him were made whole, and so forth. Make you a list of those kind of statements. And just look at them once in a while and say, boy, wherever I preach, wherever I minister, wherever I go witness, that's the results I expect. The benefits of redemption are for you. If God healed everybody then, he heals all now, that is, all who come to him and want him. Terrific. And next week, we're going to go some more on this, and it's going to get better yet. May God bless you and make this burn in you to be able to go out and help people. Amen.